very much again, uh, Stephen. Uh, you agreed to come and we had a wonderful ride together. Um, so we ended up with that geology survey of Pakistan that you did for eight weeks, you said? Yeah, I started the PhD project, so I was doing the literature review, which is the first section. Uh, and um, after about you know, six weeks, uh, uh, my supervisor came to me and said the funding's been pulled. So yeah. I stopped. <laughs> so um, in, eight, in, uh, in eight weeks, what, what, what were your findings? Did you find something? I had the major fault systems uh, mapped out. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the geological map of Pakistan uh, and then um, looking at the seismic hazards. So trying to get uh, past earthquakes and what had happened. Six weeks, I hadn't, I'd hardly done anything. Um, so, uh, well, I you probably got this in my folder of uh, various uh, historical things, but this is going back twenty years. So, uh, did you travel also, or you were no, just, no, you were just looking no, at the data? Just the. Uh, this was start of the project. I uh, was paid uh, one month. The second month, I wasn't paid, <laughs> uh, and that Sorry was a uh, stipend. And then uh, the, the funding was moved to other things. So yeah. it was really literature review prep for the project. If I was going to go do the field work, it would have been late first year, second year that I'd be there. Hmm. They, they don't just send a student out on a PhD, go look, you'll be fine. Yeah, you have to do all of the uh, paperwork for the project yeah. first. Yeah. Uh, you've got to have your research proposal. Uh, so literature review, then research proposal then you can actually do something. Mm. And with, uh, with a project like this, um, it's field work, so we would have need a full ethics and um, a risk assessment going through the committee before I could have done anything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, another question from your, your past, you said about music. If it was music, what would it have been, the guitar or the piano? The piano, piano. I played piano uh, from about the age of eight. I played it um, at home um, and I had lessons for several years. And I had my keyboard, uh, I kept playing um, all the way through into university while I was doing my geology uh, program. In the first year, uh, while I was in uh, the halls of residence, there was a person on the floor above me who would smoke out of the window. Mm -hmm. And he threw the cigarettes down onto the sloping roof yeah. and they built up in the gutter. And then there was heavy rainfall, which because of these cigarettes overflowed the gutter and went into the, the ceiling above my room. The ceiling burst uh, and only fell on my keyboard. <laughs> I'm so, I'm, I'm so sorry for that. That was the end of that keyboard. And the hall's insurance said, we won't buy you a new keyboard, but we'll pay for someone to fix it. And someone tried to fix it, and they said, it's okay, but it never was. So uh, that, that was the end of my playing. I, I think I carried the keyboard around for another two or three years, but it pretty much stayed in its box. It, it never sounded the same. Mm. Uh, my condolences for your key keyboard, oh. but so I was very sad at the time. <laughs> you just reminded me of this after twenty years. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry for bringing back this traumatic experience, and it, it should be uh, as as for for a kid, uh, especially. Um, you know, the thing is that moving from music to teaching. I mean how you came to know that you should go into teaching rather than research or some field work? Well, I uh, came to the end of my PhD during uh, the um, 2008 uh, economic recession. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were very few jobs available. I think when I was looking for jobs, I only found one and I applied for it and it was a a position for University of Liverpool in China. Mm. So that was the job and uh, I managed to get through interview. They, they uh, brought me on as a lecturer. There were no other options 
at that point because uh, uh, the construction industry goes in cycles. When there's an economic recession, the construction industry tanks. You, mm. you cannot get jobs there. The same as mining. Uh, if there's an economic recession, you can't get jobs there. So lecturing was my option and there was one job. Mm. Uh, and then I spent um, what five, six years uh, working in China from that. Seems like everything happened um, to you um, by circumstances or... Yeah, um, I had no so, choice. So it, it was not like, um, um, like something um, you were pushing really, I mean you were mostly just in the moment enjoying the time. Oh, that's, that's right. Um, some people plan out everything they do. Yeah. Uh, I'm not that person. Um, I work based on opportunities. I always struggle with uh, like the uh, annual um, progress review where you're meant to say, these are my goals for next year. Yeah. And I say, right, I'm going to wait for a random company to approach me and talk to me yeah. and I'll talk to them and it might produce something. Yes. And that's what I tend to do. Uh, the, the planning side, yeah, I might put in a load of goals, but actually... I achieve more than what I say I will achieve just by waiting for the opportunities. And as long as you're active, as long as you keep doing things, then opportunities arrive. The key thing, I think, is to keep saying yes. Okay. Until you get too tired and then you say no. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, can, can you further expand on that? Uh, you talked about the opportunities arrive if you're active. And then the other thing you said, keep saying yes. Can you further expand when you say keep saying yes, saying yes to who? So you get an email from someone who's interested in doing something. You think, oh, that's going to be a huge amount of work. And there is a pressure there to not do it. But if you do things, then people start talking about what could you do? What other opportunities are there? And if you do something difficult, you then get more opportunities given to you. If you don't do it, then your name never comes up. Hmm. Now, there's a, I think I, I should have asked this question later. The first thing is getting the opportunities, getting the people know that you exist. Um, so, and I think you linked it with being active. Yeah. And when you say you should be active, opportunities will come. Please expand it from the context of students or anyone who is starting, I mean, uh, who don't have a profile to pick out and show and who is not in the... To, to becoming an academic or uh, Let, working in industry? Let's take example from academic. I, okay. I hope it is um, the same blueprint that we can apply in any other field. Uh, oh, possibly slightly different. So for yeah. academics, the, the key things are um, that you are always doing something. Uh, and the background thing is reading. Um, you are always reading something, keeping up with your field. Um, if you're not doing that, then you're writing something. Uh, and you have to make sure that every year you publish at least one paper as a minimum. Um, I'm running at what... Um, well, I only really started uh, publishing in 2016 and I've got 26 papers uh, since then. So I'm running at what, three-ish, just less than. That's very, that's very good, that's very good. So we are so, talking... Um, so you're always doing something. We, you're talking about 26 publications in journals, like ranking? Uh, journals and conferences. Mm -hmm. Journals only, I would need to look, um, look and check. Hold mm. on, no, no, no. No, 26 is on Scopus. Mm. So it's more than that with the conference publications. Yeah, so uh, let's try to link it with the, with, the, with, the, with the students, fresh graduates who are trying to get the job. Um, so uh, the theme of the discussion that I do mostly here is how students, fresh students particularly, can become employable. Okay. Um, now, the publications, of course, this... And the, this, for most people, publications is irrelevant. Irrelevant. 
yeah, you, you only really need publications if you're working in academia. If you're going to work uh, with an industry, then publications are a bonus. Uh, for civil engineers, actually the key thing that most employers are looking for is experience. And yeah. that is a real challenge as a fresh graduate. It pretty much means that during your summers, you need to get internships in engineering companies so that you've got that experience that you can sell. Uh, another thing that um, students ask me is, uh, should I go to work or should I do a master's mm -hmm. after university? Yeah. And I normally say uh, doing a master's is a little bit of a challenge for engineers uh, in terms of employability because you get to the end of the master's and you're up against someone who has graduated and has one year of experience in industry. And at that point, the company's going to go for the experience mm -hmm. all the time. So if you have your internships in the summer, then that might give you the edge where the company will say, this person. However, getting the masters means that your trajectory is, is higher. So you can get uh, promoted more easily because after one year of being employed after mm -hmm. the masters, you've got undergraduate, postgraduate, one year experience against undergraduate, two years of experience. Mm -hmm. People go with the one with the masters. So you can get the promotion more easily. And so it's a difficult balance. Um, if you've done the undergraduate and got some experience, it's useful to go back for the masters. Uh, but as soon as you start working, you get used to being paid a relatively huge amount of money in comparison to so being true. a student. Yes. And you then say, right, I'm going to stop having this money yeah. and I'm going to start my master's program. And, and start paying money instead and start of getting paying money. money. And it's really difficult once you've started being employed to go back to student lifestyle. And many people who say, I'm going to do that, they never come back to the masters or they come back much later and do it as uh, part-time evening weekends. But as life starts getting in the way, it's, it's a big challenge. But for engineers, that is the better option. Uh, get the experience, then come back to the masters if you will do it. <laughs> Mm, okay, so other than having looks, uh, we discussed that looks um, bring promotion quickly. Um, and just to be politically correct, we were talking about the people who look a bit older. They, um, uh, no, that, yeah. that's, that's academic. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, from ac 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 academia. Um, so there's, there's lots of different ways to do that. Yes. Um, for example, if your last name starts with a D, then you're more likely to stay longer as a doctor than become a professor. Come again about, about this. So, duh, duh, Dr. Daniels. Yes. You're more likely to remain as a, a doctor if your last name begins with a D than if you've got any other letter. You're more likely to get early promotion to become a professor if your last name begins with a P. So, Professor Potts. You, you are much more likely to become a professor. Is this theory? This isn't theory, this is published research. <laughs> yeah, that is, I was about to ask that, can we verify this theory? And so yeah. this, if it's published, we can go back. So yeah. if You're it's more likely to get promotion in academia if your first name be, uh, is at the start of the alphabet in comparison to the end of the alphabet. Um, because uh, there's two different publishing routes. One is alphabetical. Yes. And so your first author, but because you're early in the alphabet, the other one is based on your effort on the paper. And because there's those two systems, you're more likely to get promotion if you're first author hmm. or, or last author if you're uh, is expected for um, research groups. But for the start of the alphabet is better than end of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. So, um, you, you talked about the internships, that, that's great. Students can do that or they can work on later. But do you think, we are talking about the skills only for the students. 
uh, how much your networking or your communications or help you in being successful or getting promotion uh, if you sell yourself mm. as compared to the others do, do you think that students should work on those soft skills as well um, instead of just solving equations I um, did you notice any such pattern uh, yes yeah um, so there's two bits on there there's a um, the social media networking side uh, and then extracurricular activities so let's is there? okay uh, let's uh, uh, look at the extracurricular activities first so as an employer you are looking for um, people who have a degree in a certain area yeah. and everyone who applies is going to tick that box mm -hmm. Uh, those who don't are removed at the shortlisting stage. So then, once you've got people who are within that box, you're looking for other things, mm. like abilities that that person has. And for extracurricular activities, uh, if you're uh, in a, a sport, for example, you can show teamwork, uh, teamworking ability. You can show that you're able to communicate with people. If you've uh, worked in a, a club or society, you've had some professional engagement, mm -hmm. then you can show potentially leadership or ability to deal with money through those extracurricular activities. Uh, and that, I think, is really um, where you get that edge when you go to interview. Uh, for networking, I think that early in employment, no one's really going to have a good network, mm -hmm. you, but you build that network with time. So you're less likely to, hmm, you're less likely to get your first job from your own network, mm -hmm. but you might get it from your parents' network or friends' network. I was about networks. to ask that, what if your father knows someone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, your, your own like LinkedIn connections are unlikely to be helpful to you for your first job but your second job once you've been in industry and you've met lots of people you've added them to your network you start getting towards two or three hundred people mm -hmm. early days uh, then you may well find a link someone will come to you and say would you like this job um, that's mm -hmm. what happened to me for my second job it was someone that I knew who invited me across for that. Hmm. Okay, so um, your first job was? Uh, in China, uh, yes. University of Liverpool. And your second job was? Was uh, Wolverhampton University in the UK. Okay, Hampton, that's, and uh, the third one is? Here, in yeah. In Dubai. And, and that was also because um, Carol contacted me. Okay. So it was, uh, uh, again, based on my network that mm. had grown, I met Carol in China. We worked mm. in the same university. Mm. And then uh, when he was leading the civil engineering program as uh, head of department or head of program, um, he was looking for a geotechnical engineer and encouraged me to apply. Mm. That, that's great. So um, talking about sustainability, I think that that is... Uh, new, relatively new uh, interest you found because uh, before you were more into um, geotech and I think you know I can see you are very much active in uh, sustainability. To, to tell me something about sustainability, what you are doing and is it just a buzzword or is it important? Oh, um, all of my research previously has been around sustainability but it's been applied sustainability so um, if we take one of my early projects, it was um, uh, biomineralization. And the idea was that if we can apply a microbial life to an engineering problem, then we reduce the energy requirements for that. We reduce the carbon consumption. Mm -hmm. and because all you need to do is, is feed a microorganism and it will do the job. It's like, um, do we use a horse or do we use a car? Mm -hmm. If you use a horse, the energy requirements is much lower, but there are some issues with that in terms of what you can achieve with uh, horsepower. With microorganisms, there's less concern. You, you can achieve 
quite a lot because they're specialized to do something. And enzymes are much more, much uh, better than catalysts in terms of uh, the, the energy requirements that they produce and the, the speed of reaction that they produce. So um, with that was uh, a project uh, solidifying sand using uh, microorganisms. So we make rock from sand. I also uh, had a project um, which was looking at the electrification of railways and whether the tunnel linings uh, would have issues with stray current from uh, the electric trains as opposed to the previous coal or diesel trains. Sustainability is um, about being able to keep doing things over and over and over again forever. Uh, the idea is that any um, waste that you produce can go into another process or ideally feed back into the same process. Mm. Uh, and this is important because if we cannot, uh, if uh, any process uses up a resource and you then get less and less and less of that thing, like let's say lithium for batteries, as lithium slowly disappears, then ultimately we can produce no more lithium batteries. Yes. So we get uh, batteries that at the end of their life they cannot be used. We then need to recycle them, extract the lithium, put it back in so that we can create something that is repeatable over and over and over again, all the way for hopefully the millions and millions of years of human existence on this planet. The alternative is unsustainable, which is uh, many of the things that we're using at the moment, they are meant to, they're going to run out within this century. Can you give me an example? Of, uh, some? Well, if we just take um, not gas, oil, mm -hmm. even sure. if we keep using oil, it's going to run out. Uh, the, the proportion of oil that is available is from fossil animals from uh, millions of years ago. Once it's gone, it's gone. So us going through this sustainability transition towards not using fossil fuels is, I guess, an, um, we're going through the process earlier than we would have to if oil did run out. Because once it's not there, it's not there. You've got to go on to other processes. Yes. Uh, we're going through it earlier because of uh, the uh, global warming, uh, climate change, um, issues that we've seen even this week. We've had, what, the hottest day in, on Earth uh, just uh, a few days ago. Um, so sustainability is important and there are lots of other issues around sustainability, but it's just about being able to keep going with uh, what we currently do into the future. Sorry. Um so talking about, uh, you, you know, yesterday I was looking at the newspaper and Dubai has introduced a recycling plant for the waste. Yes, waste it's, to energy plant, mm, yes. Yeah, to, to convert into energy and it's worth 4.4 billion dirham, I believe. And it will generate around 220 megawatts of energy. Yeah. And it will also save a lot of um, landfill. So I think it, in this investment, when I looked at 4.4 billion dirham, I was like, okay, maybe it was too much, maybe someone has too much money, but I think by looking at the results, the end results and looking um, 10 years from now, even 10 years, I think it's, it's totally worth it. So I, I, I agree with, with what uh, people are thinking and I must admit that 20 years ago when I read the first paper about recycling and sustainability and I wasn't very impressed. I thought it's, a f uh, it's uh, you know, uh, some, someone had too much free time to raise this issue and it's out of proportion, but um, uh, it took me only a few years to, to revisit my thought mm -hmm. and said, okay, no, that's, that's not the case. And um, um, so... Uh, uh, it's, it's one of those that's not really for us because pretty much well, most things, apart from a, a few um, uh, relatively minor things, will last for our lifetime. Mm -hmm. But so many things 
will not last for our children's lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so if we are able to get to the point where every process is sustainable, then what we do, our children will do, our grandchildren will do all the way into the future. And this, this is the, this is the uh, issue. And do we go for the economic advantages that we get now, but then mean that our children can no longer have that level of lifestyle? Or do we invest in our children's ability to have a good life through changing the processes now? Okay, I think this uh, sounds good, but do you think we have to first, we have to not first, but in parallel work on the legislation as well, other than the technology? Um, uh, I think the other way around, well, in, in parallel, in parallel. Um, there's, there's a balance here. So you can say uh, in legislation, we will only use sustainable techniques. Uh, that is unrealistic at the moment because the sustainable technologies and techniques, some of them are, it's profitable. You must, you've got to be doing this, otherwise mm. you are wasting your time as a company. Uh, the, the shareholders get more money if you follow this sustainable technique. Yeah. Um, but some, it is more expensive at the moment. Uh, for example, if you uh, were installing solar panels on your house 20 years ago, mm. you would be paying more for your electricity than you are paying now, mm -hmm. uh, than you are, would have paid then. Yes. Uh, Whereas if you install solar panels now, mm -hmm. it's cheaper. So you should be installing solar panels. And for many technologies and the legislation can follow the cost as long as there is investment in the development of that technology. There will, however, be a point where we just have to accept that we cannot get the technology to a point where it is the cheapest option. Mm -hmm. And there, there has to be a legal solution where you either ban the unsustainable technology or uh, you subsidize the more sustainable technology. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a really difficult call. There are, especially where you get things like um, uh, the cost of food is going to rise if we follow a sustainable mm -hmm. route and it will rise now. Or uh, if you don't follow the sustainable route, of course it's gonna rise in 50 years, but there are poor people now who need food at a reasonable price. So that creates some really difficult issues as we look towards a sustainable transition. Mm. Not all of the technology is ready yet. Mm. So uh, if someone wants to educate him or herself about um, sustainability, do we have any such avenues, events, conferences going on in Dubai or UAE in general this year? Ah, there's a huge amount. Um, COP28 is coming up. Yeah. So um, there are everyone, <laughs> pretty much everyone is creating sustainability events. Yeah. Um, the university is going to be running a huge amount um, because it's got the um, previous Expo Australia Pavilion, now the Innovation Centre, yes. which is going to be, what, 200 metres? maybe 300 from where the negotiations will be going on mm -hmm. uh, for COP28. So um, we want to support every aspect of sustainability that we possibly can. And we, we're gonna be running sustainable fashion event, uh, which uh, will be, uh, there's so many different aspects just to that. And that, that will be um, early November. Um, we've got a conference on timber construction uh, which is coming up. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at sustainability within the transport industry. Um, there's uh, sustainable business practices. So huge number of events. We'll try and fill that venue. And that's just the university. And 
every company will have something that they are doing in the run-up to COP28 because it is, it's a global event, it's so important. And this in the UAE is the year of sustainability. Yeah. So everyone is contributing towards the year of sustainability in the way that they can. That is uh, fantastic because still we, are, we, are, um, we did recording for half an hour and 10 minutes in the car. I think that that is enough. Yeah. I, I know you have time. It, it feels only like about 10 minutes. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. The sustainability, what you're saying, do you, do you have any, you know, the viewers, if anyone want to contact you to discuss, do we have any group? Are they, can they contact you through email? Can I put your email somewhere? Or? Yeah. Um, every academic is a public figure. So um, my email address is on the University of Wollongong Dubai webpage um, within the, the faculty. If you just search University of Wollongong Dubai and Stephen Wilkinson, you'll find me. Uh, you'll also find everyone. Uh, every academic is a public figure. That's good. So they can they can send you an email. That's another case. If yeah. they will get a response or not, but they can. Uh, they yeah, can I, I'm uh, what my about 250 emails behind at the moment. So it depends on the time of year as to whether there'll be a rapid response so or not. You need, you need a secretary. Um, uh, it's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, part of the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation. I'm uh, on the organizing committee. Yeah. And the micro mobility or last mile mobility is one of the key elements mm. uh, for this. Because um, we can deal with the large scale, get a train, use public transport, get a bus. But once you get to the bus stop and you need to get to where you're going, how do you deal with that? And these uh, micro scooters are one of the, the key elements. Uh, the, um, the importance of this is that the barrier that it produces, or the barrier that there is uh, to uh, using public transport, so, so many people will have private cars just because and the bus doesn't stop where I need to stop. Mm -hmm. So having this, these options for the um, last mile mm -hmm. uh, is important to getting more people using public transport. Uh, it's a, a key policy requirement. Uh, so, t talking about the heads, you are um, uh, the member of the organizing committee, you are the member of some sustainability committee, you are the director of research, you are a lecturer, you are father, you are a husband, and you have 24 hours only. Uh, how is it going? How do you manage? Um, or you stop thinking about it, you just, just see how yeah, it's going? Um, I'm not sure how. I don't have a strategy. and. Um, I don't know what, what you count as managing. Do I need to, if, I, if managing is keeping up with the emails, then I'm not. <laughs> uh, at the moment, every now and then, I have to take a weekend to catch up. Hmm. So. Steve, thank you very much. I think we should end our discussion. We have to um, yeah. keep few topics for, for another meeting. Thank you very much for coming. God bless you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.